I wanna take a second before we start this video and give you guys a quick disclaimer. I am not a licensed electrician. I am not any sort of qualification that is needed to do this stuff. All I have is a lot of experience working with this type of stuff in my own way. I was never formally trained. I carry no certifications and anything you try in this video, you are trying at your own risk. That's all I have to say. We're gonna jump into the video now. Hey guys, Forrest here with Fofo Astro, and today it's finally time to do part two of my telescope power management video series. So if you missed part one, I'll put it up there in the corner and I'll link it down in the description. Make sure you watch that first. In that video, we talked about how to figure out how big of a battery and what type of a battery you need to power your whole setup. Now, if you have mains power, if you have like a 110 outlet in your observatory or within range of your observing setup, this video is not for you. It's definitely not, not gonna be what you need. This video is gonna talk to those people who are going to be observing maybe out in the field, maybe you are too far away from mains power to run an elect electrical cord, you don't wanna use your car, or you have a remote observatory, different things like that, people who need to run off of a battery. So we know how to size our battery. This video I wanna take a look at, now that we have that battery power, how do we get it to all of the devices on the telescope or on the mount? Because, you know, we have potentially a focuser, we have a mount, we have uh, a CCD, we might have a filter wheel, you might have dew heaters, there's a lot of stuff that you have, and it's a real big pain to have to run cables to every single device. If you have seven devices attached to a guide scope, right? If you have seven devices attached to your mount, that's seven individual cables coming up from the battery. So what I wanna talk about today are the things that we need in order to safely get power from the battery, which we talked about last video, to all of the different devices on the mount. So I'm gonna flip the camera around to see some paper. We're gonna draw out a little schematic, talk about what we need, and you guys will be along for the ride. Let's go ahead and do it. All right, so here we are, we've got our piece of paper. And the first thing that I recommend doing is making a list of all the different devices that you have uh, with your telescope and specifically how much power they draw. Now, this is something that you probably already made in the previous example, um, in the previous video, we, we did the same thing, but it's important to bring that diagram back up because a lot of the fusing and things like that that we are going to do relies on the power draw of our different devices. So either pull that up or do it again here. I'm just gonna list out a few in this example just so we can have something to work with. So for me, I've got my camera and I know that my camera pulls three amps. So I'm gonna put three amps. Uh, I have my, and I don't care about amp hours in this situation, we already did the sizing. So the, the hour um, amount won't really matter as much. We're more just looking for draw here. I know that my filter wheel draws about 0 0.5 amps. I know that my mount draws about 1.5 amps when it's slewing. Obviously that's less when it's not slewing, but you wanna draw the most, you wanna put the most amount of draw here. And I know that my dew heater draws about 0 0.5 amps. So I have all those, we already pre-calculated those in the last video, but it's good to put them here. So what we're gonna need first is, I wanna work at the device level backwards, and we're gonna kinda see how this all works. Basically, we need an individual power line running to each device. And the idea of that is so that each device can have its own fuse and each device can basically be protected from any issues down the line of the other devices. So what I would do is kind of consider each one of these as their own thing, their own entity. And to each one, there's gonna be a positive and a negative cable running to each device, a separate device, separate power cable running to each one of those. All of these devices then need some sort of hub. It doesn't really make sense if they're all just kind of out there on their own. So what we wanna add in here is a fuse box. And a fuse box can come in lots of different shapes and sizes. I recommend one from Blue Sea Systems. They're a um, like a boating marine brand, but they make really high quality fuse boxes. I actually have like three or four of their fuse boxes and I really like them. And you're gonna buy a fuse box that has enough individual fuses that each device can have its own circuit. So if you have six devices, maybe buy a fuse box with eight circuits so that you have a little bit of room left over for growth. It's a big pain to buy one that's too small and then you later have to upgrade. So what's gonna happen is into this fuse box, and we'll work with what goes into this in a second, I guess I'll start with out of this fuse box is going to go a cord, a positive cable to each one of our devices. Now the negative cable sometimes comes out of the fuse box, 
Other times it comes out of another sort of hub. I recommend buying a nice fuse box that it actually has a negative cable connection as well. It just helps keep things cleaner. So that negative cable would come out of each fuse on the fuse box as well. And we're left with all of our devices having a place to connect to. Now in here, there are gonna be automotive blade fuses. They're those little fuses that cars uh, used to use, sometimes still use, and each fuse has its own number on it. You wanna get fuses that are as close to the maximum draw of your different devices as possible. But as an example, they sometimes don't make 1.5 amp fuses. So you might have to get a two amp fuse for a 1.5 amp draw. As long as the fuse is as small an amount bigger than the amount that the maximum draw is, you're gonna be saving yourself. So in this case, I'd get a three amp fuse. I think a one amp fuse, I don't know that they make 0.5 in that variety. And then I get a two amp and I get a one amp. Um, I'm gonna leave a link down in the description for a really great fuse uh, resource that I found because a lot of the automotive places or Amazon sell them in big batches of like hundreds and you don't really need those. This place lets you order them in quantities of five and it makes it really easy and nice. So pretty simple, we have positive and negatives running to each device and we're able to control and basically make sure that all of those devices only get the amount of power that they need. Now, if you put too big of a fuse, say you put a 10 amp fuse on your camera, that doesn't mean that the camera's gonna blow up. <laughs> it just means that if the camera, anything goes wrong with it, um, the fuse won't pop until something goes wrong enough that 10 amps run through that cable. And that just doesn't pop quite as soon as you want it to. So you wanna make sure those fuses are sized the right way. Also, when you're using this cabling, you wanna make sure that the wiring you use to connect your devices to the fuse box is a high enough um, gauge, or I guess I'd say a low enough gauge, because with gauges, the lower the number, the bigger the wiring is. What I like to do is I actually just take the AC adapters that are included with these devices and I chop the ends off. I know people are probably like, why Forrest, why? I just chop the ends off and I, I solder the plus and the minus or I attach the plus and the minus to the fuse box because it already has the right barrel connector. It already has all of that. I actually have one of those ones I chopped the end off right here. You guys can see there's the barrel connector. This is for my USB hub, but you can see that's the power connector. And that was attached to an AC adapter that plugged in the wall but I just chopped it off and I put an on off switch on it just in a little light just cause I wanted to. But this connects now right into my 12 volt power system that I use in the observatory. So I basically just cut it and, and you don't have to do that. You can buy obviously this size barrel connector and it has a plus and a minus inside of it and you can kind of have an extra one. But for me, since I'm all 12 volt, I didn't really have any issue just chopping the end off and go and go in this route. So you can definitely do that or you can order the barrel adapters Long story short, you need to get this little end, whatever your end your device uses, into the positive and negative on your fuse box. And also, make sure you don't mess up the positive and negative. Um, these, little, these little barrel connectors, the outside is either positive or negative, and the inside is the opposite. So you wanna make sure that you are uh, reattaching things properly, otherwise you'll blow your devices. Um, I really recommend using like a multimeter or something like that to identify what's positive and what's negative. Super simple, easy to do. Um, really just keep it the same as what it was when you chopped the end off of it. Okay, so we've got our devices. We've got them plugged into our fuse box. Now, one little uh, addition here that you can add if you want to is the ability to remotely power cycle these different devices. Um, I made a video on how I use my Arduino power controller um, previously, and you guys can watch that video. But basically what that talks about is instead of the negative line here, or the positive line, doesn't matter which one, making a direct connection between the fuse box and the device, it would feed first through another box like this. So it basically just kind of piggybacks on there. And that little box is a relay controller that you can control through your computer. And I personally have every single one of my devices feed through a relay box on its way to the device. So that from home, if I have any issues, like the other day, my, uh, my camera was giving me some trouble um, and it was out at my parents' house, like, you know, 10 miles away, I didn't have to drive out there to power cycle it. I was able to use my remote relay controller to turn it on and turn it off remotely, which was super, super sweet. All right, so let's stop here for a second. I just wanna basically review a little bit so that you guys make sense of this because it's super simple. We list our devices out, we list how many amps they are, and we buy fuses just above the number of amps that each device needs to pull. 
as close to the just above as you can get. We then attach each device's positive and negative to the positive and negative on our fuse box, and we put in the respective fuse into the fuse box. At that point, every device has the ability to be powered, and it is a safe connection because the fuse is going to protect any sort of overdraw through those lines. Now, how do you get the wiring from the fuse box to here? Well, if you have a barrel connector, just like an AC adapter, you can chop the end off and attach the positive and negative to the fuse box and plug the barrel connector in here. Or you can buy barrel connectors with positive and negatives on Amazon and install them that way. One other thing you can do is, let me grab it right here, you can actually buy these. These are pretty cool. This is a barrel connector on one end, and then it's got just an open positive and negative on the other end, and you can attach your own wiring into those holes and tighten it down, and you've basically got a barrel connector to your own custom wiring. Now, if you are gonna use your own wiring, keep in mind you wanna keep the wiring gauge low enough that it can carry the amount of current that you need to use. I recommend just using 16 gauge all the time. Um, not really, a, not many Astro related devices are gonna pull more amperage that 16 gauge wiring can't handle. So I think that's a pretty good size for most things. Also, because I'm in my shop right now, it's super convenient. This is the size of 16 gauge wire. You can see it's nice kind of thick. The internal wiring is nice and thick. This is an example here I'm gonna show in a second of 22 gauge wire. So you can see it's very thin, it can't handle nearly as much current as the 16 gauge. 16 gauge comes in spools, really nice and easy. I just would order a big spool of that on Amazon. I literally have spools just hanging out in my shop right now. Um, and I would use those to wire everything together. If you don't wanna chop the barrel connectors off, you could just use this and then some, some standard 16 gauge wiring from Amazon or from you know a hardware store or a automotive store or something like that. Okay, so we've got power to our devices. Now, what about going into this fuse box? Well, all you gotta do to go into this fuse box is you wanna have one connection from your battery running into this fuse box. And this is where you need to make sure that that connection as well is fused. Because again, we're trying to fuse everything here. We don't want any wiring run to be unfused because unfused to me means dangerous and I don't like that. Now, I wanna say one thing before we talk about this. This fuse box, ideally, you will mount on the telescope because that makes the wiring super simple. If you mount this on the telescope, all that has to run to this is one positive and one negative cable from the main battery. So if you're able to mount this on the telescope, then all you gotta do to run up to this thing is one cable, which is super awesome for cable management and keeping everything clean when you slew your telescope around the sky. So what I recommend doing is if you've got your big battery bank down here at the bottom, this is your big battery, um, on either the positive or the negative lead. It doesn't really matter which one, theoretically. I usually fuse my positives, but you can fuse either side. You wanna get yourself a fuse, and you wanna put, basically, attach the fuse in between that positive line. The negative would come right down and attach. So this would be a fuse here. Now, how big of a fuse? Well, that's pretty easy math. All you wanna do is add up the draws of all of your devices. And in this case, I've got what, 0 0.5, 0 0.5, which is one, so 2.5 plus three, I have 5.5 amps here. So I would probably get a 10 amp fuse to allow for future expansion. Now, if we're gonna be drawing 10 amps, think about it, all of these devices are gonna be pulling through these two wires here. So you're gonna to wanna to make sure that these are sized properly to handle 10 amps worth of current. Now, 10 amps is pretty chump change, so you won't really need, I think actually 16 gauge wire can handle 10 amps over short distances, but I will link a chart down below in the description that basically helps you compare how big of wiring you need in gauge in order to handle certain current amounts. In my observatory, for example, I actually have about 30 amps worth of stuff at 12 volts. Don't think 30 amps at 110, 30 amps at 12 volts that gets drawn. And so I have the wiring size needed to handle that 30 amp load. So you just wanna make sure that you have large enough cable to handle it. If you wanna be safe, use something like 10 gauge. 10 gauge can handle most everything. And that doesn't mean that all these individual wires are 10 gauge. It just means that the main wire running from the positive and the negative 
of the battery to the main positive and negative of the fuse box are high enough to handle the load here. One other note, make sure your fuse box is obviously rated for the amperage that you're gonna feed through it. Most are, most are gonna be rated for well more than we are gonna use as astrophotographers. So what I would do, you guys, is I would get a nice battery, like we talked about in the last video, and I would get a nice box for that battery, and I would mount this fuse inside of that battery box with two leads coming out of it, and make it real easy to just plug those leads right into your fuse box. If you guys have a grab and go setup, you could use something like Anderson power poles. Um, I can show you guys those. That's what this is right here. Anderson power pole is a type of connector that makes it really easy to uh, basically make an interconnect between two halves of wire. And what I mean by that is if you wanna be able to disconnect your battery from your fuse box, you could basically just put an Anderson power pole right here and an Anderson power pole right here, just like you guys can see on there and these would connect to one another. So you could unplug your big battery from your whole setup, you could take it away, and that way you're not always tethered to one another. Um, they also make a lot of cool things, let me pull this out real quick, um, like Anderson Power Pole Hubs, that just allows you to plug in multiple devices and they all share one bank of power. So there's that whole Anderson Power Pole system allows for a lot of uh, customization and flexibility and things like that. So this is how I would do it. Main battery, feeding through a fuse, feeding through probably some sort of disconnect, feeding into a fuse box, fuse box feeding each device, and preferably having some sort, if you want to, some sort of remote power control between the fuse box and each device so that each device is independently power controllable. Again, if you are a car observer and you're just going to the you know dark sky site being next to your car, you can totally just flip the switch on all these things independently or unplug them or pull the fuse out if you need to power cycle them. But for me, wanting remote control, I need that ability to power cycle things from wherever I happen to be. So that is the basic rundown of how we get main power from a battery, a 12 volt battery, all the way up here. Now, a couple quick little disclaimers I wanna say. Again, this is only if you're operating in a 12 volt system. The other thing I wanna say is not all your devices might be 12 volts. This is assuming that all of your devices are 12 volts. If you have a device that's not 12 volts, you're gonna need to add in a voltage converter or a voltage step up or step down. And what that's gonna do is that can take the 12 volt and it can step it up or step it down to the amount of voltage that the device needs. If you are gonna do something like that, that device would fit in right here, kind of where we were gonna fit that remote power control. It would basically fit in between the fuse box and the device itself. As an example, my personal uh, USB hub that I used for years and years and years was seven volts. So I had a 12 volt feeding it out of the fuse box. That 12 volt fed through a power step down, which stepped the 12 down to seven, and then that seven volts fed right into the device itself. Also, this is all direct current, not AC current. Again, if you have AC power, you're gonna need to use an AC adapter when you build all of this stuff. All right, so hopefully you guys watched the last video, you watched this video, and now you have a great idea on how to do all this stuff. Again, I'm not a licensed electrician, I'm just simple. Uh, this has been something that I have worked very hard to understand how to make 12 volt systems very safe. So hopefully that made some sense. If you guys liked this video and you want more on electrical and how this all works and how we can configure things to work the best, hit that like button. If you dislike the video, you know what to do. If you guys have a question, leave it in the comment section down below. I'll do my best to answer it. Lastly, please, please, please understand that I am not licensed and what you do is at your own risk. I did all this stuff. It worked for me. I've done it multiple times with a lot of different people, but you're still taking risk working with electrical. If this feels like it's over your head, it's probably over your head. If you guys like my channel, hit subscribe. I love it when I see new subscribers. It's awesome. If you guys hit that bell icon, I really appreciate it. It, it really lets, it really helps out the channel when you guys get notified when I post more content. So thank you guys, and I'll catch you in the next one. Clear skies.